Hey, hey, if you guys are seeing me, give me that thumbs up. Let me know that we are live and you can hear us. Bobby, give me one second to make sure that we are live and everything is working properly. And let me check those comments, see if you guys are giving me that thumbs up already. Hello, hello. Oh. All right, so much fun when I do that. All right, make it sure, make it sure, guys. One more second. Okay, I'm going to say we are good to go. <laughs> I always love the intros with this. It's so cool. All right, happy Wine Wednesday, everyone. I hope your week has been fabulous. I hope your night has been even better. Hope all of your seahorse and reef tanks are doing fabulously, and I'm so excited to introduce our Wine Wednesday guest tonight, Bobby, aka Humblefish. Welcome, sir. Thank you, Kelly. It's great to be here. Absolutely. And we're going to do things a little bit differently. Instead of hearing me ramble on with endless questions for an hour, we're go I'm going to ask Bobby a couple of questions to introduce him, and then we're going to open up the floor to the comment section and to the others in the in the call tonight. So, yay, you don't have to hear me. <laughs> okay, so Bobby, let's just start at the very beginning. What got you into the hobby in general before we jump into your calling? So I was actually five years old and my father had been keeping marine aquariums for, for several years. And uh, I think he just basically got tired of me, you know, wanting to help him. Um, so he basically said, okay, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to help you set up a tank. And it was a, it was a 29 gallon um, aquarium with an undergravel filter and crushed coral and bleach corals. And I think, you know, some of the old timers can remember that. And he says, you're either going to learn how to take care of this or you're going to lose it. So, and I've, I've had an aquarium ever since. Nice. And so then the, the next obvious question is you're titled Dr. Fish. Um, can you tell me what got you into studying the diseases and trying to figure that out? So about, I guess it was around 15 years ago now, um, I had a powder blue tang that I was just in love with. And um, I wasn't quarantining back then. I was just, you know, putting the fish in my tank and um, she kept getting diseases. She kept getting ick. She got flukes and um, I really did not want to lose her. And, and my usual management techniques were not working. So that just kind of lit a fire inside of me. And I said, I'm going to do whatever it takes to, to save this fish. And I did. And that just kind of got the ball rolling. Cause then I started reading peer reviewed articles. Uh, I started doing my own experimentation and it just has kept me going ever since. Awesome. And I've got plenty of questions for you, but as I said, I'm going to open it up. So my final question before I do open it up is, can you tell me a little bit about um, how Humble Fish started, meaning it started as a business, correct? As a company? Is that? Yeah. So I, I did have a company um, and I'm going to reboot it called Humble Fish Aquatics. And it was, um, I was selling quarantine conditioned fish. Um, and I basically started it because I'm pretty much disgusted with the, with the aquarium industry and, and um, the supply chain and how, you know, there's disease fish and fish constantly dying from various diseases. So I decided to do something about it. And I started by um, selling quarantine conditioned fish. I'm taking a break from it, but there's about five other vendors now that are on my forum that have kind of taken over and are, are selling quarantine conditioned fish to people. Nice. And I've got, I've got a little question about that later, but as promised, I'm going to make everybody else um, part of the conversation real quick, if I can get there. And um, Bobby does have a um, little presentation for us about tank transfer method in a little bit, but I thought maybe we could get more, dive more into like peroxide and other topics, and then when you're ready, you can get it. Does that sound okay? Yep, uh, all right. Great. So um, do you guys want me to continue with my questions, or do you want to, does anybody want to jump in and ask one start off the bat? You guys probably are like, well, what is he? What? Tell me more about him, right? <laughs> Sorry. Okay. All right. Um, Bobby, is there anything that you want to share before I start grilling you with the questions, like free fall? Um, well, you want to do the presentation a little later, right? I. Mean, you know what? If you want to do that really quickly now, and then we can go into questions afterwards. Do you want to do it that way? Yeah. That works yeah. for me. I Sorry. 
Go ahead. Okay, I just wanted to do a, a, I'll try to make it brief. It's a presentation on hybrid tank transfer method, which is a, a, a new quarantine protocol that, that myself and others have been working on. Um, let's see, I've got like a presentation here. All right, share screen. Okay, and then play. Okay, is that showing up? Uh-oh, it's not. Uh -oh. Hang on just a second. No, it's probably on my end. Give me one second. It's coming up on this end. I know. Yeah, I it's in the stupid on the Zoom. There we go. Okay. Sorry. Go ahead, sir. Okay. Okay. So I'll try to make this brief. So basically, before we can talk about hybrid tank transfer method, we first have to understand tank transfer method, which is where hybrid tank transfer method comes from. So to do tank transfer method, you basically need and this is just an example of, this is just a 10 gallon aquarium. You can see a heater, a thermometer, there's an air bubbler. Um, and, and this, you can use this as a very simple quarantine tank. Now to do tank transfer method, you need two of these. You need, you need one of everything you need. I'm sorry, you need two tanks, two heaters, uh, uh, two bubblers, because you're gonna be transferring the fish from one tank to another. And I kind of dug this image up on the internet. This might be a little bit more fitting um, for your target audience, because this is maybe a little bit more what you could do for a seahorse tank, yep. for a quarantine tank, because it's got the fake uh, plastic plants that I know sometimes I've seen uh, used with seahorses. Okay, so the, the basics of, of, high, of tank transfer method is moving the fish every 72 hours. So on the first day, you place the fish in the initial quarantine tank, and then roughly 72 hours later, you transfer the fish to the new tank. Um, the time of the, you do the transfer is unimportant, but you never must exceed the 72 hour window. The temperature and specific gravity of the new tank should match the old one perfectly. So you can just catch and release the fish with no acclimation and you wanna transfer as little water as possible with the fish. So as you can see here, you do the transfer. I mean, if we include the initial transfer, it's a total of six, I'm sorry, it's a total of five times. So you have a day, day one, day four, day seven, day 10, and then day 13, when the fish is now ick free, because that's what tank transfer method was originally developed for was to, was a prophylaxis treatment for ick. Um, after transferring, you immediately sanitize the old tank and all equipment using bleach or vinegar. You rinse well, and you let air dry thoroughly before uh, using. I actually like to blow a fan over the tank and equipment to ensure you know proper and thorough drying. And so basically this is kind of the reason why you need to have uh, two of everything because you don't really have time to sterilize the tank before the transfer. So you have to have a duplicate tank and equipment so that you can keep doing these transfers. Um, this is like a little, and I don't know really if this would be appropriate for seahorses or not, but I'm, I'm not a big advocate of nets because of how fish get tangled up and damaged. So this is actually like a square plastic colander that you can use to transfer the fish during the transfers. If the hard plastic is an issue with seahorses, you can get a, I'm sure like a, a softer uh, colander to use. Okay, so this is just some like overview of tank transfer methods. So this is a whole list of rules and, and everything how to do it, but the, the top three are the most important. The transfers need to occur every, every 72 hours or less, not more. The total number of days to pass should be 12 or more, not less. A minimum of four transfers are required. So when I say four transfers, we're not counting the initial tank that the fish was put in with more required of doing transfers more frequently than every 72 hours. If your schedule dictates that you have to do the transfers every 48 hours, every 24 hours, that's fine. So long as you reach 12 days with the transfers. Um, so one thing I wanna point out is one detractions from using tank transfer method is the amount of salt used. And because, you know, I mean, you do go through a lot of salt doing tank transfer method, but if you're sure that your display tank is pathogen free, you can actually use water from a stored water change to do tank transfer method. So it's kind of a way of recycling your, your DT water to, to use for quarantine. Okay. So then, then so that, that was the basis of tank transfer method. So how does hydrogen peroxide come into this? So Hydrogen peroxide, and, and you know, I know that peroxide, which I believe is 35%, is, is optimal, but that's not really accessible to most hobbyists. So you can actually use the 3% hydrogen peroxide that you see here that you can buy at Walmart or most drugstores. Um, I show here 
you're going to need um, uh, for, for measuring purposes. You can see that here. I prefer to do the, um, when I do the peroxide bass, which we'll get to in a moment, I like to do it like in a glass bowl, like you see here. You can also do them right in the transfer tank about 30 minutes before you make the transfer, if, if that's just easier for you. Or if you want to maybe take a gallon or two gallons of water out, put it in the bowl and do the hydrogen peroxide bath while you're, you know, you're removing the old transfer tank and setting up the new transfer tank that works as well. Okay, so th these kind of give you, and this is all on my website and my forum, but basically this gives you the directions for doing the uh, peroxide baths. Uh, the dosage is basically is 20 milliliters of 3% H2O2 per one gallon of salt water. Um, at current time, I am like, so basically you wanna have the salt water you're gonna use. You wanted to have it um, pre-oxygenated and set at the right temperature. We're still kind of trying to figure out just how much um, how much does like, you know, running aeration, like uh, an air stone during the bath, how much that actually degrades it or not. So I'm just telling people, look, for the time being, let's play it safe and let's just create no gas exchange or aeration during the peroxide baths to maintain the concentration at it's actually 150 ppm. Okay. Okay, and then, so this is how we kind of put it all together. So it's like, okay, so, so now we have, we, we know how to do tank trans, transfer method. How do we incorporate hydrogen peroxide? So if you kind of look at this, day one, everything is the same. You place the fish in the tank and, but then 30 minutes before you're gonna make the transfer, you would dose hydrogen peroxide either in that glass bowl that I just showed or in the transfer tank itself. And that, so you would do that 30 minutes before you only expose the fish to hydrogen peroxide for 30 minutes. Day four is the same. Um, you, you don't now, we have had at least one case now where flukes did slip through this method. So that's why you kind of see at the end of day four here, you do have the option of using ProZipro or General Cure to do deworming. I don't know if, if it's actually a problem or a one-off thing or how big of an issue flukes are for, you know, monogenians are for seahorses. But so you have this on day four. And then on day seven, you do it again. And again, on day seven, you wanna do the um, 30 minute peroxide bath. So the whole point is that, that hydrogen peroxide is dosed twice, six days apart, and for a maximum of 30 minutes. Now you'll also see in here that you could use, and I'm kind of getting off on a tangent here, but you could actually use formalin instead of hydrogen peroxide. I feel that peroxide and formalin have the same killing capacity when it comes to, to parasites. So that's just another option to consider. But if we're kind of staying with this at the tail end of day one and at the tail end of day seven, you're gonna do the hydrogen peroxide bath. Okay, so then the question is, well, why are we using hydrogen peroxide? So this is an abstract from one study that I've done research on. There's some other studies to back it up and I've kind of, it's a little sloppy, but I highlighted at the bottom, you can see, if I can just minimize this, oh, okay. Um, so basically you're seeing here that if you read the highlighted part that 75 or 150 milligrams per liter, which is PPM, eliminated velvet trophons without causing loss to fish. And this was in a single, in a field trial, a single treatment of 75 PPM. When it was applied six days later, it reduced velvet trophons to a non-detectable level. So this is the study that we're basing it on. It was done on Pacific Threadfin, where they infected them with, with velvet trophons. And this proved that peroxide um, cleared it at doing two peroxide baths six days apart. Um, there's some other studies that back this up, but this is basically the primary basis. I also believe that if 150 ppm hydrogen peroxide can eliminate velvet trophons, I feel there's a strong possibility that it can eliminate other pathogens like brook, uh, flukes, perhaps you know, tulubularians. So, and also being that hydrogen peroxide is an antiseptic, it could possibly clear bacterial diseases. So this kind of becomes what we're hoping, and it's still in development, more of an all-encompassing treatment that you can use on fish in lieu of using copper or other medications. And that's it. Awesome. All right, let me try to get us all back showing okay. now again here. Stop sharing. Yep, that should okay. help. Hang on, we're coming back, It might have been back, a little bit confusing, but... <laughs> okay, there we go. You're back. And I'm back. Hi. Okay. Hi. Hey to everybody who's joined. And um, we do jump around. This is really laid back stream. 
Um, that's why we appreciate so much Bobby coming. And he had wine in hand, y'all, in case you just didn't notice that. <laughs> but again, I'm going to open it up. Um, before we got started, um, Dan, and, because in, in the seahorse world, obviously, we're interested in the reef. Um, and I personally talked with Jessica about how I was using hydrogen peroxide in a reef tank and uh, for, for more for algae reasons. And I just had no idea that it could be used in, you know, in a treatment setting until, of course, I met Dan, who, you know, now we use hydrogen peroxide in seahorse tanks where uh, just to like um, lower the organics so that the ciliates that feed on organics are lowered. And Dan's going to correct me and say this better in a minute, <laughs> but, and all, you know, but, and also hydrogen uh, baths and um, that kind of thing. So Dan, you and um, Bobby were talking before we got started here, and I was just curious um, if you could repeat your conversation real quick. <laughs> For instance, like, how does it equate? Like, you just saw the presentation, Dan. How do you think that equates to seahorses? Well, I think part of it does. I do have a few comments and a few questions. Feel free. Um, my, my first thing is, is that for the seahorse people watching, one thing that uh, people with regular swimming fish don't think much about is heaters with seahorses can be problematic mm -hmm. and um, they'll hitch to them. And unfortunately, their instinctive response is when something is wrong, instead of letting go, they tighten their grip. So quite, it's very common in the winter months to see people asking for help because a seahorse has got severe burns from heaters. So if you are going to use a heater in a seahorse tank, it needs to be covered in such a way that seahorses can't burn themselves and hitch to it. Um, and it's um, the other, the other question I, a question I had was on the peroxide. How much are you figuring for um, milligrams per ml on 3%? Uh, it's 20, it's 20 milliliters per gallon is, is the dosage I'm using. Okay, so you're you're just, wait a minute, right, 20 mLs per gallon. So what um, that equates to to milligrams per liter. Yeah, well, according to my math, I got 33. Five point, and a half per liter. <laughs> There's Marina. A four and a half per liter. Well, when I break down peroxide, uh, at three percent, I get thirty-three point nine milligrams per mL. Um, and I was just the math wasn't working was why I was trying to figure that out. Um, Thirty-five percent is three hundred and ninety-six thousand milligrams per mL. And then uh, you mentioned the three percent. Um, I don't know if you're aware. Twelve percent uh, peroxide is readily available if you go to a um, beauty salon supply place you can get what's called 40 volume developer and if you get okay. clear developer it's nothing more than plain 12 percent peroxide oh and i did not know that you can buy it by the gallon and it ends up being more economical than buying a whole bunch of three percent okay um, a lot of people in the seahorse world that i've worked with use that now that can't i get 35 percent locally for eight bucks a gallon so, oh, wow. I wish I could get that. Right. Yeah. Um, I have a chemical supply place that supplies it. So it's, you know, I, I always have two or three gallons on hand. And in fact, I use it in a hot tub instead of bleach. Um, <laughs> I told you he was about hydrogen peroxide. <laughs> Go on. Now, the, the tank transfer method was interesting. And it's used sometimes in commercial aquaculture when you run into problems with diseases with fish, where you keep switching them out from one tank to another tank. And um, that can be a very effective way of dealing with things without necessarily having to go through a whole lot of drugs. Um, my other question was, do you feel that vinegar is an adequate um, thing to use for sterilization? I, I don't, I think vinegar um, can, I don't want to say sterilization. I think it's vinegar is good for being a disinfectant. But I tell people that if you're gonna um, you're gonna use vinegar or citric acid to disinfect, that you need to dry thoroughly afterwards, because I believe that that's the actual sterilization that occurs when you dry. And then I tell people that if you're gonna use chlorine to sterilize, you still need to dry thoroughly to you know let the any chlorine residue you know gas off. So it you know you you you're not you know getting chlorine residue in the tank. But no, I don't think vinegar vinegar is a good disinfectant. I don't think it sterilizes anything. Yeah, I, I've never used vinegar because my, my theory is that 
at least what I was taught in aquaculture, it's the lowering of the pH that kills the, uh, the bad guys. And, you know, most people using vinegar dilute it so much in the water, they're not dropping the pH low enough to have the impact. Um, right. You know, in commercial aquaculture, uh, I use uh, phosphoric acid uh, instead. And I use it straight strength to wipe the tank down and then rinse and then bicarb it to bring the, the pH back up. Um, the other thing I use a lot is 35% peroxide instead of bleach or um, acid, because if it's not something that needs a severe cleaning and it's something that's relatively clean, a quick wash with 35% peroxide pretty much wipes out anything that's there. Um, the, the only thing I, I've not, I haven't really had much success with peroxide as far as removing is a uh, biofilm that sometimes gets on like sumps and aquariums and I actually have to use alcohol uh, like rubbing alcohol basically to remove that um, because that biofilm and I'm getting on a tangent biofilm is an issue with medications <coughs> because of bacteria basically hide under biofilm they right. can biodegrade medications yep I, I agree with that um, when I'm dealing with a heavy biofilm then I go to the um, phosphoric acid um, but I'm doing it also on a commercial level, not at the hobby level where everybody has all this stuff at hand. Um, right. But high st strength bleach will do the trick as well. Um, and of course, the other thing is, is that if you have a biofilm, you probably should be scrubbing it as well as uh, uh, just putting something in there. And, you know, it, I see this with Artemia. What people, a lot of people don't realize is that tanks that are heavily scratched or containers that are heavily scratched even when you use chemicals and even when you scrub it, you don't really get inside the cracks and the biofilm protects what's in the cracks. And I was shocked the first time that uh, I cleaned my Artemia vessels, I scrubbed them out with non dishwashing detergent, which I normally do with all my Artemia stuff. I wash it with soap first. And then one day, just for the heck of it, I came back with peroxide and the whole bloody thing started fizzing like crazy. And I said, wow, this is not clean. So I scrubbed it again. And once again, it started fizzing like crazy. And then I cleaned it with phosphoric acid and then the fizzing stopped. So I realized that all my vessels, I've been using a green scrub pad and scratched the dickens out of them. And I ended up replacing them with new ones and got you know pads that would not scratch and solve my problem in that respect. But if we're using old tanks and stuff, you know, I think it's worthwhile to realize that if you're doing something like this, it's better to have good equipment that's not uh, deteriorated that can harbor a lot of stuff within the scratches and stuff. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I, circling back, can I actually ask you a question? Does, does sure. my dosage seem, because you seem, obviously, you know more about peroxide than I do. Does my 20 mil, 20 ml per gallon using 3% H2O2, does, does that jive or, or no? Well, if my math is correct, and I, I could be wrong, um, sharing between the, the 20, industries, that's 678 milligrams, and we're talking 3.8 liters, right? Um, so that's 178 uh, milligrams per ml is my math. Uh, so it's close. Okay. It's so it's reasonably close to about it because my what I'm targeting is is 150 ppm. And the reason, just to explain that that I guess why I'm so attracted to three percent peroxide is because that's something that any hobbyist can just get in the middle of the night at Walmart or a drugstore. Because I run into scenarios where people contact me on my form or whatnot, and they're like, my, you know, I'm losing everything. I've got velvet in my DT. Everything's dying, and I know that the fish need, you know, need temporary relief because copper doesn't provide temporary relief. So the peroxide is something that, you know, instead of telling, okay, we'll order formalin or order, you know, another drug that's going to take two or three days to come in the mail. I know that they can go, you know, anytime, day or night, get the three percent H, you know, the three percent H two O two, run the fish through a thirty minute peroxide bath to provide uh, temporary relief as the fish are in route to QT. So, you know, that that was the reason I was so attracted to 3% peroxide was basically to help hobbyists sure. that, you know, didn't have immediate access to other drugs. Quick question yeah. about that um, before you guys go on. Um, obviously guys, uh, I posted in the comments, I'll be sure that the links to the website and the forum are available um, in the comment section when we're done. Absolutely, or, you know, if anybody wants to put them in there now, Jessica. <laughs> but if not, I will, no I worries. That. And on. yeah, and we want to talk to you too. But my question was, so you're not saying that hydrogen peroxide is a 
replacement for these medications. You're merely, or are you? Uh oh, I lost your voice, Bobby. Uh -oh. uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Okay. Well, at this point in time, I'm saying that a single, your internet connection is unstable. That's not good. Uh oh. Uh, okay. It, yeah, I just got to, okay, so at this point in time, I'm saying that a 30 minute, a single 30 minute peroxide bath is only useful um, for temporary relief of, okay. of velvet, brook, and other diseases. However, I'm more confident that if you do hydrogen, I mean, if you do um, hybrid tank transfer method and administer two peroxide baths six days apart, I'm far more confident that that is actually is a replacement for many of the medications we use, especially copper, which I'm really trying to get I'm, I'm trying to get away from and I'm trying to get hobbyists away from because I just I hate it. I hate copper so much. But, you know, I understand it's still the standard for quarantine, but high um, hybrid tank transfer method with the two peroxide baths was actually designed to replace that. Can you give us a little teeny bit more about why you and if your Internet connection goes really bad, you can um, leave the Zoom and come back if necessary. But it still seems fine here, guys, in the comments. Let me know. Okay. Um, but. <laughs> Sorry, can you um, I'm good. go a little teeny bit more about why you dislike copper? Well, it's a poison. And uh, the only reason that, that, um, that you know, fish, you know, fish are, are surviving is because they outlive the parasites. I mean, basically, you'll have situations where um, basically the fish succumb to it. But basically, if the fish can outlast, if the, if the, if the fish can outlast, the, I'm getting confused here, basically, in most cases, the only reason that copper works is because the fish are able to survive longer in it than the parasites. Absolutely. And there's evidence that um, that copper intake actually damages a, a, a fish's uh, a gut flora. Mm -hmm. um, it lowers their immune system. It makes them more susceptible to bacterial infections. So it's it, it's a necessary evil at this point in time, but in, in it, it can be used to clear ick and velvet, but it does a lot of damage to the fish along the way. And I think you talked in a, in a separate um, stream or, or interview about um, resistance. Isn't there, isn't resistance beginning? Go ahead. So there, there's some, and this is anecdotal, it's not been sure. proven, it's anecdotal evidence that it seems that, because um, it used to be when I used chelated copper, and it used to be that the therapeutic range was 1.5 to 2.0 parts per million, and that has always worked for me. And now there seems to be anecdotal evidence that certain strains, especially velvet strains, are actually surviving 30 days. You know, sometimes there was a, um, a report of, uh, I think it was one 1.75, 1.8, that velvet actually survived that for 30 days. And that never happened before. And the only thing I can come up with to explain that is I know a lot of wholesalers um, like to use subtherapeutic copper to manage diseases in their holding systems. And it's possible, I don't know how often they sterilize their systems, but they could be building up you know, just like super bugs with yeah. antibiotics, it's, it's copper resistant strains of, of parasites. Mm -hmm. And then when, when the hobbyist then tries to treat with therapeutic, sometimes the treatments are not working. I've actually seen, um, uh, there was a curator of an aquarium say that uh, he has had failures at 2.0. So now we're kind of, now we're treating at 2.5. That's kind of like the new standard. That's the new top therapeutic level is to treat you know, whether using copper safe or copper power, you're going to treat 2.5 ppm. But it's like the higher we raise the copper level, the more poison we're dumping on the fish and just hoping that they can live through it. Absolutely. And Dan, I was just curious to kind of like bring seahorses back into it because I have so many questions for Bobby, but want to make sure um, I hush so you guys can talk too. But um, Dan, copper is a big no-no with seahorses. Is that correct? No, it's incorrect. Okay. Tell me why copper is okay with seahorses. Um, it's very rare for seahorses to get ick, uh, but when they do, uh, it's, copper can be an effective treatment management, and seahorses handle the copper just fine. Okay. Uh, as 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 other fish do. You know, I'm not going to tell you it's not a good it's a good thing to use, but mm -hmm. right. uh, I know of a couple instances where, you know, 600 seahorses came in from overseas and they had ick in the gills, and <sighs> copper was used to treat them very effectively. Okay, um, and my next question. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, my next well, question. Actually, like, can I ask a quick question yes, on this? Yes, of course. Sure. Um, Dan, what what type of copper do you recommend using on seahorses? Like Coopermine or which brand of copper? I, I don't have a recommendation. I've never used it myself. Okay. Um, I've never had to. 
And, you know, I'm talking with other people in the industry that are dealing with it. And, um, but I know of several instances where they have used it. Um, I want to say they used a chelated form of copper, but I could be mistaken. Okay. That would make sense. It's more, it's usually better tolerated than like cupramine or, or copper sulfate. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, one of them, I wouldn't put it past them to use whatever they had on the shelf. Um, <laughs> the other couple that I dealt, talked to, they were very conscientious in what they were doing. Well, and my next question, thought, et cetera, was um, obviously, Bobby, you're a, a huge promoter of quarantine and of, it, it, correct me if I'm wrong, but of prophylactically treating, or do you um, recommend, actually, let me back up. Can you tell me the difference between a, an observational hospital tank and a medicated quarantine in which you recommend for fish? So if you're gonna do um, a medicated quarantine tank, then in most cases, you're gonna use copper and you're gonna use, well, the two main medications would be, would be copper and, and prosy. Um, copper treats for ick and velvet. Um, Prozzi treats as the dewormer that you use to treat for flukes and, and black kick and things like that. Um, if you're quarantining uh, chromis or clownfish, you might want to use Metro, which then treats for brook and uranema. Um, so basically what I recommend people do just to keep things simple is I use copper power and I combine it with API general cure because general cure contains Prozzi and Metro in one medication. You can also use liquid Prozzi Pro, which is another popular dewormer. Um, so I would say to keep it simple, if people wanted to quarantine, then they should put their fish through 30 days of copper treatment, you know, 30 days at therapeutic levels of, of copper treatment, do a water change, and then you would apply either General Cure or Prozzi Pro two times about six days apart and doing a 25% water change before the, uh, the second treatment. So that would be if you want to do a medicated or what I call like a prophylaxis um, approach to quarantine. Mm -hmm. If you wanted to do observation where you're just like, I'm not going to use any medications until I have to, I'm just going to put the fish in quarantine and watch. That's a perfectly uh, fine thing to do. Um, I recommend using black mollies, like taking freshwater black mollies, converting them to salt water um, because they'll have no resistance or immunity to marine pathogens. So you know, when you're watching the fish in quarantine, you're watching the fish and you're also watching the black mollies um, for evidence, you know, white dots showing that they have ick or velvet. Um, you want to do that for a minimum of 30 days. Uh, and then obviously, if, if either the mollies or the fish show signs of disease, you need to, uh, to medicate. And as far as what you should do, it's actually more about you than the fish. If, if you have a lot of time on your hands, to sit in front of a quarantine tank and, and watch fish. And when I say watch fish, you're not just watching for, you know, the classic white dots that are ick or velvet, you're watching for behavioral symptoms such as um, uh, head twitching. And if the fish is scratching or if the fish is yawning or- Oh yeah, us sea or folks know all about watching that. Go ahead, sorry. <laughs> So, so, you know, if you have the time to do that and you can see uh, you're looking for evidence of diseases, then I think that works for you. But um, if you look, a lot of people nowadays, they're busy, busy, on the go. They don't have time to babysit a quarantine tank. Then I think you want to consider at least some uh, form of prophylaxis. But that could be the tank transfer with hydrogen peroxide, right? Uh, yes. Your, your method. If you have the time. Right. You know, that, that is that is labor intensive um, to have to every three days. You're breaking, you know, you're basically yep. moving the fish into another tank and you're breaking the tank down. You're sterilizing. I think with my 10 gallon, I was doing it. It was taking me 30 to 45 minutes, you know, every time just to move the fish, break everything down, sterilize everything put it in front of the fan and then go about, you know, the rest of my day. And so. all the water for sure. Nicole, I have a... uh, go ahead. I've got, remind me though, I've got two questions about mollies sure. that were asked yeah. to ask. Go ahead, Dan. Um, would you advocate doing this with buying directly from a breeder? Mm -hmm. I, that would be a, a good idea. My, my concern with breeders nowadays, I mean, if you can buy directly from the breeder, I think that would be great, but I know what's happening a lot of days is that breeders are now having to sell to wholesale facilities and the the captive bred fish is then being mixed in yep. the same systems as wild caught right so i mean that's even a worse in my opinion that's even worse because you're actually taking fish that have no acquired immunity or resistance and you're mixing them with these wild caught fish that have you know diseases you know that from the ocean and 
Absolutely. then it's more likely, yeah, it's going to, it's going to take the, the captive bred fish down quicker. Uh, I would argue that the captive bred fish really, there's not, when you look at the immunity aspect, captive bred fish, you know, a lot of people think because they're in a captive environment, there's no exposure and that's not true. And in fact, in many cases, the exposure is higher because of the high densities. Um, and hurt the, people in the sea, mishandling in the seahorse world, I can't relate to the fish world because I don't do fish. Right. I do uh, seahorses. But in the seahorse world, getting seahorses, you either buying them in a store or you're buying them from a breeder. And right now, the only reputable breeder really, um, you know, there's 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 so limited that uh, you know it's a different ball game buying from them as opposed to you know walking in a store or getting them from a wholesaler. And in fact, right now they're not even selling wholesale because they don't, they can't keep up with the retail demand. Right. But, um, but that's kind of like comparing, I, I think the difference, because Bobby, I actually agreed with everything you just said, uh, because, and I know a lot I'm of- I'm not disagreeing. No, I know, I know. <laughs> and and <laughs> no, I was just making the point that um, Dan's been doing this a, lot, a long time and he knows his stuff, but a lot of newer breeders that are, you know, just dealing like, like Holly and such that are dealing with the store, they face that where they're like, hey, are you going to put the sea or my cap, my seahorses in their own tank? And not mix them in with all these others because of what you just described. Um, and there's there's pros, cons, and everything in between. We're here to chat it all out. But I think kind of that in the seahorse world, um, a breeder, the good ones, um, are comparable to like your old business that's, that's uh, selling quality fish that have already been treated or were born obviously in-house and, and raised without the... Uh, raised in a way that, that uh, the breeder is not guaranteeing, but knows that they don't have the things that we're worried about coming in. You know what I mean? I, I just rambled right. all that I know, but <laughs> I kind of, I got what I said. I know you guys in the audience did too, right? Okay. Anyways, um, the other question I had though is, and I do want to ask about the mollies, but when you're talking about prophylactic treatment or um, even even tank transfer with hydrogen peroxide and et cetera. A lot of times with seahorses, especially if you're buying from a breeder, they say, you know, Pua, no need for quarantine because they're from a breeder. Um, many breeders would disagree before anybody jumps in. But I'm just saying that my question, I'm getting to it. My question is, how not that stressing the fish more after it's just been through shipping, after it's just been, or is it necessary, period? Um, I feel it's, I mean, it, so it's good and it's bad. It's, it does stress the fish out, but then you can, one can argue that by stressing the fish out um, and you're stressing their immune system, they're more likely to show symptoms of diseases, which may be underlying. Gotcha. So what would a fish that may go into your DT that may be asymptomatic by putting it actually through the stress of quarantine, you're more likely to bring those diseases out. Um, and so that you know then it pops up and you can treat it before the fish goes into your display tank um and th there are ways of making you know i mean i primarily use you know the whole the bare bottom you know with the pvc caves and all that for quarantine but you know what for people that are or don't like that and they want to basically put the fish into an observational quarantine tank you can basically set up like say a 20 or a 29 gallon tank or a 30 gallon tank and you can make it a miniature version of your DT if that's what you want with rocks and corals and everything else. Mm -hmm. And I mean, if that's how you feel, that's the best way to observe a fish in a more natural environment to reduce stress. There, there's nothing wrong with that. I just tell people that if you're going to do that, make sure you have like a little 10 gallon tank with everything you need on the side. So if the fish does show symptoms of disease, you can pull the fish, put the fish into a hospital tank and then apply treatments. Absolutely. And that, I mean, that's what we do here all the time is, you know, we can give you recommendations. You don't have to take them, <laughs> you know, exactly. and if it's something else works for you. Cool. Let me ask the two Molly questions because I feel like other people probably have questions and I got to check your comments. But Nicole, how shout out to Nicole since she couldn't make it tonight, really had at, uh, wanted to know about Molly's and if you have any thoughts, recommendations about the time and the method to convert them to salt water. And then my secondary question, going to give you a a uh, multi-question here, I'm really, really bad about that, is um, once you do notice something on mollies and say, okay, so obviously this whole, the fish that I have in this tank with these mollies all need treated um, if you're using them in quarantine, do you then, I mean, you obviously probably treat the mollies too. Is there any 
and then what happens to them, I guess. Go ahead, sorry. So um, the way I, so, okay, so when you go to the pet store, wherever you get freshwater mollies, um, I like to set up, you know, like a 10 gallon tank for them, you know, with a bubbler and a heater and all that. And um, I usually put them in like, you know, 1.009 uh, specific gravity, which is hyposalinity. They can go right into that with no problem. And then I take about uh, four to five days by doing a, a water changes, aggressive water changes, and, and then slowly bring the salinity up to whatever um, the, the quarantine tank is. Now, I have done a second. So here's the thing about quarantine. Most of the times, we, especially a lot of people like to order fish online, which are a lot of times they're being, you know, drop shipped directly from wholesalers. Those fish will usually come to you at about 1.7, 1.017 or 18 specific gravity. So another thing I've tried and it's worked really well is if my quarantine tank is set that low, you can actually basically just take the mollies in the bag. You can actually just um, uh, remove most of the water, just leave a tiny bit of water in the bag. And then over a period of several hours, you can then take a cup of salt water from your quarantine tank, put it in the bag and, and slowly acclimate them that way. I actually just did that on, I think it was like three or four black mollies, didn't lose a one. Um, I will say that when, if you're gonna use black mollies, the sailfin or balloon black mollies seem to work better. They're sturdier and they seem to handle the acclimation process better than the smaller black mollies. Um, so I would advocate that. They're also larger and so they can handle aggression from saltwater fish a little bit better. They're actually, um, they're, they're sturdier and they seem to handle the flow of a, of a saltwater tank better. Um, so you can do it either way. You can do it a slow process by putting them in a tank, taking four or five days or longer, or you can just do it in the bag. Um, and, and it usually works out, at least it's worked out well for me. Um, so when you put the mollies in the tank and you watch the mollies and if they do what I say, hit for a disease and you have to treat the mollies along with the fish, um, when you're all done, you can actually put the mollies right in, as long as you don't have any predator fish, you can put them right in your, uh, your display tank because they actually do great. They're, they're herbivores. They'll eat nuisance algae. Yep. Um, and I would think they would actually get along really well with seahorses because they're not really, I know seahorses are, are carnivores and eat like mice or shrimp and whatnot. And I would think that the mollies would eat the algae and they would actually complement one another pretty well. I have mollies in one of my seahorse tanks, so I can vouch for that one. <laughs> and uh, Nicole is getting ready to do that and you probably not for the purposes you've recommended or talked about, but um, yeah, anyways, um, great. And then and then basically when you got new fish, in, if it was fish, not seahorses or whatever, then you would take the mollies and put them back into the quarantine with the new fish, right? Or get new. Well, or yeah. Well, here's the thing. Okay. As long as the mollies have not been introduced to a saltwater pathogen, then yes. But the, as soon as a molly shows symptoms of a disease, we have to just assume that their immune system is now familiar ah. with saltwater diseases, and that makes them no longer useful as a, as a test fish, if you will. Gotcha. Hey, it, Jess it's based on the fact that they're, that they're in fresh water and they have had no prior exposure to saltwater pathogens. That's what makes them the perfect canary fish, if you will, because you know, they will probably show symptoms before any other fish because they have no acquired immunity. They have no resistance. Absolutely. Hey, and Jessica, I'm not forgetting you. I'm going to jump over to you in a second and ask some uh, forum questions. But Dan, I'm curious, what do you think about the mollies at, um, like in that situation as a quarantine with seahorses? Would it work the same way or no? I suppose you got to remember too that uh, seahorses are different than regular fish in that Please. they don't have the gut associated lymphoid tissue, the galt. So that's responsible for the adaptive immunity of most fish and seahorses do have some type of adaptive immunity, but we don't understand it. Um, so seahorses can be very susceptible to uh, particularly bacterial things. Um, you know, we don't usually see a whole lot as far as ick and, you know, right. some of the other things that we see in marine fish, primarily we see ciliates and um, particularly uranema mm -hmm. and, uh, bacterial issues. Um, now, I don't know if you've ever seen it done before. One of the things that I've done is I've actually had people who've had six seahorses and we transfer them out to a hospital tank for treatment, regardless of whatever type of treatment. But we have the problem is what do they do with the hot, the regular display tank at that point? Good point. And many times they can't, you know, um, just wash it out, you know, empty it out and start over. 
So normally what I've been doing with people, it's usually about two weeks that they're dealing with a hospital tank. I've been having them dose it with low doses of peroxide and probiotics. And I've been doing peroxide at one, usually one part per million, sometimes two, which is low enough that it doesn't affect the biofiltration. But the idea being that you're slowly oxidizing the organics or the food for the bad guys. And then the probiotics, of course, done um, opposite of that in a 12 hour opposite. So if you're doing the peroxide in the morning, do the probiotics at night. Um, to, again, do the same thing, eat up the organics. How many days do you do that for? Two weeks. Two weeks. So it's two to two weeks. You do 12 hours of you dose peroxide one time between, say, 2 ppm. And then 12 hours later, you dose uh, probiotics. probiotics. Yep. You do that for two weeks. Okay. Yep. And if the problem is, if you get up close to five parts per million, you'll st your nitrobacter will start taking a hit. Uh, it'll okay. affect the, that first. And, you know, I've played around with it many times. And it, it really depends on how much organics are in the system. But seahorse tanks have a tendency to be very heavy in organics because of the mechanics of the way the seahorses eat and digest. And so about. So Jessica has actually, so while I've, all of my research, if you will, is focused on doing these high um, dosage peroxide baths before the fish ever enter uh, the quarantine tank, Jessica has actually um, done some experimentation where she's actually done in tank peroxide dosing to treat possibly Belvin and Brooke, if you'd like to hear about that. Please, yeah, that Jessica. Cool. Yeah, Jessica. Okay. <laughs> so um, about a year ago, I ran into a problem where I had another round of some sort of parasite in my DT. I had gone through this a couple of times already, uh, velvet for sure, in two of the tanks. I have four tanks, two of them got velvet. Went through Bobby's whole um, you know, regimen of pull them out, treat them with copper, all of that. Lost 57% of the fish uh, during treatment. And when it hit again, it hit my large tank, which is a reefer 525, and just too many fish, 14 fish in there to, you know, try to take out. I didn't have a lot of confidence in treating with copper. I've also used chloroquine, but had five fish end up with what seems to me like brain damage after that. Oh, geez. Um, so I'm not a big fan of chloroquine either. So I decided to try dosing uh, peroxide straight into the tank, started at one mil per 10 gallons, which is about 0.75 parts per million, worked it all the way up to one mil per three gallons, which is about 2.75 parts per million. I didn't go higher than that because I have a mixed reef. So SPS, LPS, anemones, softies, all of it. Um, didn't see any problems as high as one mil per three gallons with um, the biofilter. We did have some people go up to one mil per one gallon in Fowler tanks, which is about 7.5 ppm, and they did see some some uh, hits to their biofilter. So I'm not surprised that Dan said he's seen the same thing. Um, we don't know what was in my tank. It was either velvet or brook. Um, I started dosing the minute I saw spots. I dosed one mil per eight gallons to start every 12 hours, increased that to every eight hours after two weeks. And then two weeks after that update, so on week four, up, updated it to one mil per five gallons and added overnight dosing. And the overnight dosing is really where we saw um, good results. Um, overnight dosing being for six hours, every 15 minutes, dosing a milliliter of peroxide into the tank. Um, it's basically double what I would dose on the, the daytime doses. And that seemed to have actually a really good effect. I, I didn't lose any fish, none nice. whatsoever during this dosing. Um, I did also dose eco balance and sometimes even waste away just to help boost yep. the bacteria a little bit. Um, but you know, no, no real issues in the tank uh, using that, using the peroxide. I did lose some softies at one point, but it turned out that was because um, I had what I thought was prosy quantel that I was dosing. Turned out to be fenbendazole. Oh, not reef safe. <laughs> Yikes. Um, yeah, so that killed a bunch of stuff. Turned out that wasn't from the peroxide. 
Um, but yeah, I had, I had really good success with it. All of my fish are still happy and healthy. I've used it in all of my tanks at this point. I even have breeding clownfish at this point, you know, so if they're breeding, they're obviously not sick. Yeah. Um, one thing, one thing I did learn is that, you know, most places, if, if so if you look at like, um, polyp lab, you know, they have that medic stuff that just basically just peroxide salt. Yep. They say to turn off UV when you're using it. And it turns out that actually UV makes peroxide work better. Oh, I'm so, so you, glad you're making this point. Sorry to interrupt, but I, I wanted to ask no you worries. specifically, go. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a wastewater treatment process. And so peroxide is basically an oxidizer. And what the UV does is it, it, it just, it enhances that. It's an advanced oxidation process. It actually makes it a better oxidizer than even ozone or bleach. So if you're specifically using it in seahorse tanks to help break down organics, combining it with UV actually might be really useful in that case. And at that point, I was able to drop back from the overnight dosing, just back into the every eight hour dosing, running UV with no recurrence of any disease. Well, so. I, yeah, I just want to say, first of all, I was doing one per 10 um, in my reef, which was mixed also just for algae reasons. So it's so cool if to know that if you add that, you know, overnight, whatever you called it, I'll have to replay it, but that's such a great idea. And I can't believe it actually helped the fish. I mean, and um, I know, I think Dan has something to say, but I just wanted to mention, we talked about Fenben, <laughs> that's what I call it. Dan Kerr, Fen whatever. Benzol. We talked about Panicure. How, Panicure, thank you. How it soaks into like rock or anything like that. And you want to, Make sure you don't put gorgonians or anything like that near it uh, for quite a while because it will still leach out. Um, so watch last week's hydroids episode. And yeah, that's all I had. So, oh, except for um, basically w which, so you're saying in a mixed reef that um, the things that might be affected if you get too high are the uh, softies. Or, or no, actually, I, I thought that was the case, okay. and it turned out that it was the fenbenzol. Oh, that's right. Okay, sorry. Um, what I what I lost once I looked back on it because it happened a second time, and it dawned on me, and I, I sent Bobby a picture of the of the powder, and he's like, "Yeah, that's fenben." Yep. <laughs> so hey, Chimp. Hey, um, Tao. Hey, everybody. Jessica. I'm sorry. I know I just interrupted you. I really apologize. I'm gonna let you finish. No but um, actually, go ahead and finish. Oh, I, I was just going to say, you know, the only concerns I have with if you get too high with the peroxide is maybe some snails, um, shrimp are kind of sensitive to it. What I did is I had it on a doser and I dosed it into the return chamber so that yes. it got mixed with the water better before it hit the DT. Mm -hmm. um, as long as you weren't blasting it right onto a shrimp, I, I didn't end up actually any, losing any there. But those, I, I tell people to ramp up. Uh, on the dosage, start at the one mil per 10 gallons or one mil per eight, do that for a week or so and increase it from there and just make sure you're seeing how things react. Yeah. Um, Zoas don't like it very much. Zoas will close up right when you dose it. Anemones will also close up right when you dose it. Uh, but I didn't see any lasting negative effects on any of those. So nice. Dan, did you have a question or thought about UV with? Yeah, a couple. Go. Um, the first one is on the UV. I agree with you. The um, when I had my road mold remediation uh, done here, um, one of the things we did was put a peroxide generator in the HVA system, which actually uses UV with a catalyst as moisture goes through, creates peroxide. Um, the my question is: Were you using any type? Were you testing to see what the residual peroxide was? I tried to. I picked up Hannah's. Um, peroxide test kit, and I just got weird readings from it whenever the, I tried the, to use it. I found the test strips work the best. They have both low think, range and high range. Um, yeah, I never tried the test strips, so what, what, I I kind of just looked at ORP because I would see an immediate decrease in ORP when I dosed it, and then as it would go back up, you know, that's telling me something's changing. So. Right. Agreed. And what what uh, brand is it that the test strips you use? Uh, I don't remember off the top of my head. I have to go look at them. Uh, they're okay. in my test kit box, but it uh, I got them off Amazon. If you look up peroxide strips, you're going to have low range and high range. Um, for most of what we would use, we're going to want low range. Um, okay. 
you know, my hot tub, I need high range, but for the tanks, I use low range. Um, what, what I found by using the strips was, is that the residual peroxide levels would vary greatly depending upon the level of organics. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in my case, I'm dealing with heavy organics when I've got four or 500 seahorses in a tank. Um, and sometimes with a hobbyist, I would still deal with high organics if they didn't have adequate filtration. And usually when I would dose, I could dose sometimes as much as four to five parts per million and an hour later have no readings whatsoever. And that's why I like the idea of a doser. Uh, I used to have some things called um, oxid oxidators, which was a German product that mm -hmm. releases uh, peroxide in the water. Um, and I used to use those in my tank till I basically warm out. So my understanding of the oxidator, because this has come up a couple of times, is that it doesn't actually release peroxide into the tank. It reacts the peroxide inside the oxidator and then releases the oxygen into the tank. So at least in my opinion, it was it's a good way to keep your oxygen levels up, which can help the fish to breathe in you know, a, a parasite situation. But I don't actually think it would be that useful as far as treatment, because my theory, at least behind the peroxide treatment in the tank is that we're targeting the free swimmers. And so if it's all trapped in the little oxidator, it's not going to have access to the free swimmers as well. But I, I could be misunderstanding how the oxidator works. Well, my understanding and talking with the, um, the, the people over in Germany is that what happens is, is that you do have a reaction, you do have oxygen that's released, and as that oxygen builds pressure, it forces some of the liquid out of the bottom. Oh, okay, um, interesting. Man, it's minute amounts. Um, and I could actually test my tanks if I went too high, because I played with different um, concentrations because of the size of the tank and the amount of stuff I had in there. Instead of using their solution, I was making my own peroxide solutions at different strengths. And sometimes I would actually get readings on my test strips of picking up peroxide if I went too high. You know, and the idea behind the oxidator was not to have a reading. It was just to have, re you know, minute levels in the water to oxidize organics and increase CO2 saturation. Yeah, when I was using them, I found that my tanks definitely were a lot easier to keep up with and stayed a lot cleaner, which told me that, and of course, that was it was in six percent h2o2 on the oxidators and it definitely made a difference of course i'm, I'm right there with you minor go minor old <laughs> yep hey they're, can, not, uh, sorry. they're not available here in the states very easily yeah can you guys talk a little bit more about why oxygen is so important i know i'm jumping around but oxygen is so important when you're using hydrogen peroxide did that make sense I'm, Everybody looked at me uh, like, what? Well, well <laughs> go ahead. So, well, I mean, my thing is, I mean, oxygen is important. I mean, from, from my point of view, oxygen is important when, when fish have parasites um, in their gills because it, it, um, it helps with their breathing. Um, usually what happens a lot of times if, if, if fish gets paras, I think the, the research I've done that the, the mucus coat, the slime coat is reduced in composition inside the gills. And that's why it's kind of the path of least resistance for sweet free swimmers to form trophons. Um, so what happens is when the trophons begin feeding on the gills and the fish releases their immune response, which is the excess mucus. And is that if, if too many trophons are feeding in the gills and basically the fish suffocates to death. So if you can increase the oxygen level in the water, it gives the fish a little bit better chance of, of surviving the onslaught, if you will, until the parasites, you know, if it's acre velvet, until they drop off. Um, that That's my perspective on it. Well, we found when we were, when I was first working with uh, hippocampus combs, then they were heavily infested with the uronema. And we found if we used the traditional dose of chloroquine phosphate, they would be dead within a matter of hours. And we did some, uh, histopath on them to determine what was going on. And one of the things the pathologist indicated was that basically what was happening is the proteins as the parasites died, which ultimately clogged the gills and in essence killed them. And we found by reducing the dose by giving 20, instead of using the nog using a 25%, three days later, <clears throat> increasing it to 50% and so on every three days, 
uh, we weren't losing the seahorses, yeah. but we also you can see the, you can see over the operculum where they would it would turn dark brown. And it was really obvious that there was something going on in the gills. Wow. So they were using uh, chloroquine to treat yes. the seahorses. Do you remember the the dosage? Uh, the original dose was what you'd find in Naga. I don't remember it off the top of my head. I'd have to okay. pull it up. Probably like forty milligrams per gallon. I think it was like like ten milligrams per liter, forty milligrams per gallon. Dan pulled out the book. Uh -oh. I'll tell you, I'll tell you so, in a minute. I'm going back a number of years on this. Hey, you guys, I just wanted to mention to Bobby and Jessica that I am going to drag them kicking and screaming if I have to, to the forum. So they'll be, they'll be, uh, <laughs> they're answering, you know, communicating with every, we, you know, I think this would... is so great when people from different sides of the hobby and industry, you know, share information, man, this is great. Yeah. Go on, sorry. You all, you all seem extremely knowledgeable and we would love to have any of you on the forum. We definitely would. I'll get them in. 40 milligrams per gallon was the dose that we were originally starting with. I, I personally found chloroquine was very hard on seahorses, and um, mm. I stopped using it entirely. Yeah, okay. I know Bobby really it likes it, work. but I, I don't like it for fish. I, I, like I said, I had five fish die after exposure to it, and they just, they were never right again after being yeah. chloroquine. I had amazing success because when I when I was running my business for the first year or so, that's what I was using primarily was was chloroquine phosphate. Um, flash arasses don't tolerate it for some reason. Uh, Antheus will not tolerate it for some reason. And it's a strange thing, but hippo tanks don't seem to tolerate it very well. Um, but most other species seem to tolerate it pretty fine. What got me off of chloroquine is I was actually working with a chemist and we were sending water samples and we found that after about three or four months, enough nitrifying bacteria was building up in my quarantine tanks where we were seeing significant biodegradation. So it was getting kind of, eh, you know, like I would have, I was having to sterilize the tanks every three or four months and reboot them. And I was really worried about, you know, one day uh, the, the chloroquine level would drop below therapeutic and I would, you know, infect my retail system. So I just felt like copper was the safer option since I had the HANA checker, I had a reliable test kit to measure yeah. it. Yeah. Well, it's interesting too that you're mentioning that there's other species of fish that do not handle the chloroquine well, just like I found. Again, though, we were dealing at that point with a lot of imports coming in out of Vietnam, Southeast Asia that were tank pen raised, and they were yet they were a mess to begin with. So they were already a disaster before they got there. And they typical life expectancy was about six months at best. Oh wow! Yeah. Uh, you guys know I jump around, but I want to, I'm like looking at my trusty <laughs> notes here. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, two more things about peroxide. One, how does temperature, I'm sorry, maybe not about peroxide, but how does temperature, um, how is temperature used to speed up treatment in, in the, um, cases that you've used, Bobby? Do you use temperature in, in the treatment? Does it affect so anything? Sorry. I, I usually treat with peroxide at, you know, 77, 78, which matches my quarantine text. Now, it's interesting that you mentioned that because I think just today or yesterday, we actually had a member of my forum who reported the first um, um, failure with hydrogen, with, with hybrid tank transfer method. And it looks like Brooke got through, he ran some antheus through it and the, the antheus, he didn't do a skin scrape or anything, but, you know, we could see like the, the, the mucus peeling, like you see on clownfish when they have Brooke. And the only thing we kind of went back and forth on the form, and the only thing I was able to isolate that he did differently than when I do it is he treated it at about 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Oh, so that's actually something I need to look into. I don't know. Maybe Dan would know is does, does peroxide is peroxide less effective at, at, at cooler water temperatures? It shouldn't be. I think I, oh. I, I haven't read anything to that uh, effect and I haven't noticed any difference. Um, and using it, I mean, obviously your O2 saturation levels are different at different temperatures. Um, you know, I, I suspect there may be a slight difference there, but I haven't, you know, anytime I've used it, I haven't seen a difference in, in my hot tubs up at 104 degrees. Well, no, and they sorry, tell you to store it. Yeah. They tell you to store it in a refrigerator. Well, that's because of uh, keeping it from losing its potency. Exactly. And that yeah. was something else I wanted to bring up is that 
uh, the 3% that we buy in the stores often has been sitting on the shelves for a long time and or people have it at home for a long period of time. So if they're using it, I usually recommend they get a new bottle um, just because of it, you know, sitting it, it, it will lose some of its potency. Now the, the 3% usually has phosphoric acid in it to lower the pH so that it stays more stable. But to keep peroxide stable, you want to lower the pH or keep it cold. Yeah, well, they, they tell you, I've got, I usually get a buy it at a gallon at, at a time and it's stored in the fridge yep. just for that reason. So the other possibility for the failure is, I know at least with ick, we've now proved that um, lower the lower water temperature actually will um, will slow down the parasite's life cycle, um, all phases of the life cycle. So maybe with Brooke, I mean, it's a parasite with a direct life cycle, the same thing occurred. I'm, I'm trying to figure out the correlation because the only thing he did differently was that I found unusual was he, he, he did hybrid tank transfer method in 70 degrees Fahrenheit, which most people don't do, you know, but um, um, that was the only Maybe difference. the cycle was slowed down, so it didn't affect it in this, the same time, right? Is that what you're saying? Well, or maybe like, I mean, it's a pet theory of mine. Maybe the parasites like actually retreated deeper into the dermis oh. to get away from the cooler water temperatures. I mean, I don't know. I can't prove that, but I, I wondered if that was a possibility. The only way you'd know that for sure would be to get, get somebody to do histopath on them and take a good look at the internal organs. Right. You know, it, with seahorses, the first thing we tell them, we tell them to move them to a hospital tank is to drop the temperature down to 68, 69 degrees. Okay. Um, it slows the bacterial growth. Right. Exactly. And in fact, in Europe, one of the uh, public aquariums over there used to recommend dropping it down to 64 because certain species of Vibrio were become non-pathogenic at that temperature. Wow. See, we're seahorses sea can handle it. Different yeah, we're dealing with some different diseases sure. than what you see in a lot of other fish. Right. Still, the shared information is awesome. Nema. I'm right. sorry? I was just saying, I was surprised to hear that uranema is a problem with seahorses. That's... Well, uranema, if you look, I mean, it's, you know, it's, obviously it's everywhere, but anywhere where you have high organics, it flourishes. And right. in a seahorse tank, seahorses being that, you know, when they eat food, they, they eject food out of their gills. They don't digest all of it most seahorse tanks are very high in organic matter if they're not properly filtered. Yeah. And in terms of rearing seahorses with all that food that's going in there, you know, you have a very high organic environment. And the two most common causes of problems with seahorses losses is going to be um, ciliate infestation or bacterial enteritis in the gut. Mm -hmm. So knowing that, that, that we'll just say seahorses are messy eaters, yeah. I would say if you do hybrid tank transfer method on seahorses, I would recommend dosing prime or Amquel daily to keep the ammonia in check since when you, when you run a fish through tank transfer method, you're, you don't have a working biofilter. Right. 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 And that, that's a great thing to bring up. But I meant to say something earlier about, I was going to ask about that because, um, oh, the, never mind, you were doing the... Uh, a short-term bath, not long-term with the peroxide. Yeah. I was just sitting there thinking that's going to wipe out the biofilter, but uh, right. that's a short-term bath, not a constant long-term. Well, the Go thing ahead. is too, you're going to have to change it more, the water quality more often with something like that because of the bio load the seahorses are going to place versus other types of fish. Absolutely. To give you an idea, a, a, a pair of seahorses, I usually tell people will eat easily one half to one cube of mice is per feeding three times a day. Yeah. And, oh, wow. Is that and, the regular mice or the PE mice? It doesn't matter whether it's PE okay. or regular. Uh, in terms of volume, that's roughly how much they can eat. And roughly 8% of what they ingest comes out their gills through the maceration process. And roughly one third of what they consume, or 24% of what's actually consumed is not digested. So when you calculate it out, roughly one third of what they're eating is ending up back in the water column. And, you know, with that organic level, now, you know, the, you have to take into account in order for that to go through nitrification, something has to eat it. So that means you either have a proliferation of bacteria or protozoans that are going to eat up that excess organics. So that explains why seahorses do so well with, with NPS corals, which need a high organics, you know, to, yeah. to do well. Yeah. 
I actually in fact, one of the clam farmers actually did very well with uh, doing seahorses where he was had a clam system and he had a seahorse system and he was running the seahorse water through the clams and back into the tank. And with, you, M with NPS, I totally agree that it's it's a good win-win situation. But when hobbyists talk about it, I'm always like, maybe get used to seahorses before you, you know, try to add NPS coral that um, need those specific feedings. And I know Marina's been waiting and waiting patiently to ask a question. So go, Marina. Hey, sorry, I was just going to ask with, um, because I TTM my seahorses, and I TTM them for three to four weeks instead of the two weeks to counter that lower temperature thing because I'm concerned that um, the lower temperature which seahorses need um, slows down the crypto or ick life cycle so much. So mm. I TTM them for almost twice as long as they need to counter that. Um, do you have any sort of indication of like the correlation between temperature and their life cycle, like how much it slows down? So there was a study, and I don't have it in, in front of me, unfortunately, there was a study um, done actually last year in 2019. And I mean, Jessica might remember, I know I posted it on the forum somewhere. But basically, I think that if the water temperature, so right now at normal reef temperatures, the, the, the trophons can remain on the fish from three to seven days. That's, that's the window. I think if the water temperature was lower to 70 degrees, I think it was more like up to 12 days that the trophons could remain on a fish where I believe with like, if you, you increase the temperature to 80, 82, then they were only staying on for three to four days. So I can find that, that if you're on my form, send me a private message, I can definitely find that study for you. And I think I have not just the abstract, but the full study. Um, but it was basically like if 70 degrees, it was, they could stay on for as long as 12 days. So yeah, that's a good point because that would definitely alter tank transfer, tank transfer method because now you're dealing with lower temperatures and, and the parasite can, it can actually stay on the fish longer. So then, yeah, that, that makes the life cycle more unpredictable. Marina, I'm going to get you in that forum. No, no worries. But go ahead. Did you have another question? Um, that was, I've got a lot. I'll, I'll ask them as they keep popping into my head. But yeah, I was wondering that with that one, because obviously um, it's not really safe to tank transfer seahorses at normal reef temperatures. Right. Right. That would be problematic. Yeah, that would be problematic. What you guys were talking about a moment ago, kind of, um, one, uh, I saw a leadway. Yes, I'm probably totally jumping topics again. Sorry, guys. But um, <laughs> Mr. Humblefish, Mr. Dr. Fish, excuse me, um, when someone just absolutely is not down with treating or quarantining fish, how can feeds affect that? Because that's something huge in the seahorse world too. And I've heard you talk about this before. Um, so how can you um, help handle a tank that is diseased because you didn't quarantine um, by, by feeds? What are your thoughts on that? By what? I didn't catch that last part. Sorry, feeds, by... live feeds or foods. Oh, you mean like if, if people are feeding like live brine shrimp and those are getting like cross contamination through live brine shrimp? Well, that was my next point, but I was looking, <laughs> sorry, I was looking more for like, um, do, do you encourage people oh. to use live feeds that are um, yeah. gut loaded to, to help fish when they won't quarantine or they won't treat? Well, the thing is with seahorses is a lot of people will go by basically the ghost shrimp and feed those to seahorses. They're wild caught, they're not, nobody's checking them for any pathogens or anything else. Yeah. And I suspect that creates a major issue in some instances. Now, if, you're buying, ghost... yeah, if you're buying aquacultured mice shrimp, that's a whole different story. Most of the ghost or... shrimp are freshwater shrimp though. True. Yes, right. which also impacts the, uh, the lipid content. So I, I think what y'all are getting at is like, so basically like how can you manage diseases via nutrition? 
Um, yes. So, so basically like a fish is, and again, I could, this may not apply to seahorses, but a fish's immune system um, is basically, um, it's basically fueled by the fish's, the, the gut flora. And to enhance the gut flora, you basically, I mean, you want to feed foods with bacteria. Um, live foods are great for that. I know, um, and I don't think seahorses would eat this, but you know, we like to use like live black worms, which mm -hmm. are freshwater, live white, white worms, or that's actually a land worm. So that the fish will eat that you don't have to worry about, um, cross contamination. Um, anything that has, you know, I, I know this probably isn't a concern with seahorses, but a lot of people that kept, you know, keep other fish, it seems like it's just easy to throw flakes and pellet in there. And, and that's not what they need. That's not the nutrition they need. They need, they need seafood is what they need. Um, a lot of, you know, people, if you're going to keep like butterflies and angels, you know, they need a clam, they need muzzles, they need um, scallops, they need that. And I know that for people that maybe live in landlocked areas that don't have access to fresh seafood, um, I'm a big proponent of LRS foods. Um, yeah. You know, he, he has excellent foods. He makes different food blends for different types of fish. And the other added feature of buying LRS foods is he soaks all the food in probiotics. So by utilizing probiotics, that actually boosts um, the gut flora, which in turn boosts the immune system. And it, um, it, it makes it easier for the fish to, uh, to fight off diseases. I mean, all fish have immune systems. It's just basically if we do things to nurture their immune, their immune system to fight off pathogens, and that's where nutrition, like I said, scallops and mussels and, and, and mice and shrimp and, any, and, and using probiotics, lacing the food with probiotics kind of comes into play to help with that. Dan's getting ready to tell us why seahorses' immune systems are different, but I just wanted no, to mention- no, Oh, no. oh, he's not? Okay. Well, the only <laughs> no, thing I, I was- gonna... Go ahead, Dan. I was going to agree with him. The oh. problem we have with seahorses is that we have a limited uh, limited diet that we can offer them uh, by the nature of the animal. And normally when I'm dealing with somebody, uh, I'm a huge proponent of probiotics. And um, usually we get them to gut load the probiotics into Artemia, whether it be uh, adult Artemia or baby Artemia, depending upon the size of what we're dealing with. Um, do you think soaking is the same though, Dan? I don't think it's the same, but it may it may have some efficiency to it. Sure. Um, you know, by gut loading, we're we're getting the well. When we use probiotics, we're using spores, and the idea is is to pack the the gut of the artemia with the the spores and get them into the seahorse to where they can do their thing. The problem that we have, though, is that most of the probiotics that we are using today are transient. They're not permanent uh, bacteria, you know. And, you know, when you look at the, the flora of seahorses, it's, it's extremely varied. Uh, it's not the same flora throughout. You know, if you go and pull a dozen sea, wild-caught seahorses and check the flora, it's going to not be the same in each animal. And Vibrio is a common uh, flora of seahorses' guts. You know, obviously it's non-pathogenic at that point, but it's ever present. Raise the temp a few degrees. Well, I just I just wanted to mention that I um, have used both rods and LRS um, foods with seahorses. And mine, at least, I know some are pickier than others, and I am talking about adult larger species, but my erectus will eat the foods, not pellets, but the frozen feeds from both of those companies krill and all that my seahorses will eat it maybe not little black worms but but you know it's it we're, we're you know it's possible and um i feel like i interrupted with that so i have a, a few more questions i don't want to keep you guys all night but um anybody else have a comment or question on that I always love when I ask and it's dead air. It's awesome. <laughs> okay, really quick before I jump into the rest of my um, Bobby questions or let Dan um, get all scientific. <laughs> um, Jessica, do you want to, if you don't, it's cool, but do you want to tell us a little bit more about the forum, what the goal is, um, what people can expect going there, you know, kind of just talk about the forum? Humblefish. Sure. I mean, it's it's Bobby's forum still, but <laughs> we're cutting you out, Bobby. Just kidding. I Go just ahead. help him run it. Um, you know, it's actually funny because we were just the, the admins and mods were just talking about this and needing to kind of put together a 
sort of a, a mission statement, right, for the forum. Um, you know, I think when Bobby started it, his focus was fish disease, but we've grown mm -hmm. significantly beyond that. I actually just a couple of weeks ago restructured everything to build it out and make it a much more, uh, you know, all encompassing. I'm missing, thank you. Yeah. I'm missing words here. All encompassing uh, forum. So, you know, our, our main thing is we're just, we're looking to build an environment that's inclusive non-discriminatory, um, free exchange of ideas. Uh, we really don't censor anything at all. Um, as long as you're nice, don't, don't be a jerk, but as long as you're nice about it and can be civil, you can talk about whatever you want. Um, we've actually had some interesting conversations that you're not going to see anywhere else on reef forums, probably. Um, the whole, the whole idea is just fostering a community environment. You know, for me, I'm not a terribly social person. Humble Fish is kind of my social outlet. And so having a place where we can really talk about anything reef related or not is great. Um, and if people want to avoid the hot topics, they just don't go to that section. They can. Right. That's exactly right. it. We have, we have ignore features just for that. You can just ignore a whole section if you want to. Um, so, you know, we're just working on growing it. It's, it's actually grown a lot. I think this time last year, we had about 400 members. And now we have, let's see here. I think we're getting close to 2,000. And I just have to shout out to everybody in this room. We're, we're, they, they've started the Seahorse and Pipefish Forum. <laughs> and it, and so far, yeah, it's, it's just it. me. So you guys need to come and help <laughs> um, with all your yeah, science. Yeah. Go ahead. We're, we're, trying to, we're trying to get more people in more areas of specialty to come in, you know, like yourself. Uh, in the seahorse section, we have Richard Ross uh, on our forum. He moderates the cephalopod section, although he hasn't done a whole lot with it yet, but it's his. Um, you know, we've got people doing breeding and, and uh, live food cultivation. We've got 3D printing that, you know, people are heavily involved in, a bunch of DIY stuff, um, you know, just general if Tal's Everything. still watching, Tal, we need you over there uh, talking about breeding. He runs the MBI for sure. Absolutely. Anyways. Absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah, I think the main thing is just we want to grow this to, to really be a community that anybody can come to and be welcome in. But if you're a jerk, I, stay I wanna, away. Go ahead, Bobby. <laughs> and I just want to stress one thing because a lot of people, you know, they, they may be afraid to like, look, I don't quarantine. I don't want to quarantine. And... I just want people to know that if they come to the forum, you're not going to be bullied or bashed into quarantining. I mean, there, there are people like me who do quarantine um, and can help you, you know, fine tune your quarantine techniques and, and all that. And then there's other people. There's Jessica. She doesn't quarantine. She does a hydrogen peroxide bath and she puts the fish right in her DT and that works for her. So I don't want people to ever feel like don't come to the forum because I don't quarantine. I don't you know, no matter what you do or what you don't do, we can help you. If you want to man, you're welcome. And if you want to manage the diseases, we can help you do that. If you want to quarantine, we can help you do that. I mean, whatever your interest is and what your, whatever your interest level is, I, I feel like we can help one another, you know, in the hobby. Like we're doing right here. That's, that's the goal of Wine Wednesday too. You know, lots of times I'll say something and Dan will say, you're so wrong <laughs> and we'll we'll talk it out and he's always right but you know hey it's cool <laughs> i did learn a lot from him though guys so i'm, I'm not gonna mis well, mistreat the form go ahead cheryl <laughs> you, you, you keep an open mind right. just because it's not the way you do it does not mean it won't work for somebody else and we see this a lot in the, the forums that i'm involved with in the uk because the only bait uh, antibiotic that i can get is batrial it's an injectable they have no access to anything else. They traditionally do things like pouchy backs and stuff like that very differently than we do in the United States. And then I'm in some Aussie groups and they're a completely whole different ball game also. So a lot of it has to do with where the person resides and what they have learned from the people in their area. And it doesn't make them wrong. It just makes it different. Exactly. Yeah, I actually, what got me going on peroxide experimentation was there was an, I don't think it's very active anymore. There was a, um, a reefing forum in Australia that there was a guy, he actually started doing the peroxide baths. And it's actually where I got my dosage info from. I forget his name, but 
that's actually what kind of got me going on in the first place. He was doing it like 10 years ago. Nice. Wow. And we have Chris from Seahorse Australia uh, jump in one Wednesday. He's going to come. He, we've been talking about having him come back on the show. He's just really busy, but I'll get him in the forum too. Um, okay. Um, jumping around yet again. Um, Bobby, on the forum, you are very interested in the fact that seahorses tolerate, tolerate formal and well. And Dan and yourself were having a conversation before we went live. So while I go check the comments and try to find all the questions in there, do you guys want to rehab that conversation possibly? Could you? <laughs> um, I think, yeah, I think I was asking, my understanding is that um, when, when you, you all use formalin to treat seahorses, it's basically like you're treating it at 25 ppm. Uh, you're dosing out if you're dosing it every 24 or 48 hours. Um, maybe you could clarify that, Dan, but I was also curious how, and I, I think you actually did answer that question that actually seahorses tolerate a 250 ppm formalin bath. Is that for 30 minutes, 45 minutes? 45. More, 45 minutes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. We treat seahorses two ways. We have the, sh the short-term bath, which is 250 parts per million for 45 minutes. And then uh, the other way that we do it is uh, long-term immersion. Technically, it's supposed to be 25 parts per million added every other day for three treatments. Now, where I run into a problem is, is that people do 50% water changes. So okay. if they're doing that, then I modify it and I have them dose um, half the dose every day. So instead of doing one ML 37% per 10 gallons, um, every other day i'll have them do the one ml do the water change do a half ml and do and follow through that way because of the water changes removing it and i don't worry too much about the dosing going up because everything that i have seen with seahorses they can handle a long-term immersion up to twice a dose um, short-term immersion is a different thing and the other thing that we do with seahorses in addition to um, formalin is quite often we will do a uh, freshwater dip and when we do freshwater dips we do that different than most people do with regular fish in that our normal recommendation is to do an eight minute dip if there's no reaction then stop it if they react to it violently then extend it out for 12 minutes oh wow that's actually what wow. i did post on the forum but yeah, yeah go ahead sorry now the reason for that is if you think about it it makes sense the 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 human reaction, the natural reaction that we have is that when they start reacting to it and become start, you know, jerking and shaking and and become violently reacting to the freshwater dip, the tendency is to pull them out immediately thinking something's wrong. Well, what's happening is, is the bugs are going nuts and they're trying to burrow deeper into the flesh. And as a consequence, it's irritating the seahorse. So doing a longer dip is actually beneficial. And seahorses handle freshwater dips very well. In fact, Kelly Jalecki, who used to run the uh, health forum on Marine Depot, uh, she used to recommend 18 minutes. Wow. Um, wow. You know, and seahorses, you know, if you think about it, they're, they're, um, they're typically found in estuaries where salinity varies greatly, and sometimes they're up in brackish water. Um, I had one customer did a freshwater dip overnight. Um, no. No, oh. she mis misunderstood. We aren't recommending the, that, folks. <laughs> no, she misunderstood it entirely, and the, the seahorse was fine, um, but it was pretty clean afterwards. Well, it's like they're finding seahorses in the Thames River right now in the UK. Yeah. And in the Thames River in the UK. Yeah. And obviously, they're supposed to be saltwater, but they are very capable of handling much higher degrees of fresh water. Than most people realize depending on the species which would which leads me into my final two things that i want to cover aside from questions in the comments and anything you guys want to cover um number one and this goes for seahorses and for fish so i want answers from everybody but does hyposalinity actually work um versus some of the other things we've been talking about and i definitely we got to cover cross contamination but um, Bobby, with you know, with hyposalinity, is that a good thing still? Does it still work as a treatment for fish other than seahorses? 
So it, it, it works to treat ick if you um, um, run the fish through hypo for 30 days. Now, that being said, the caveat here is there actually have been two studies where two different strains of crypto ick were, were found to be resistant to, to hypo conditions, which is 1.009. Um, so now how commonly encountered those strains are, um, who knows? Hypo is also good for eliminating flukes, skin flukes. Um, I recommend one week. There's some other sources that say you should go as high as 35 days um, for skin and gill flukes, but it's another treatment for flukes. The, the danger, well, first off, the problem with hypo is in order to execute it properly, you need to have a perfectly calibrated refractometer because you have to keep the, you know, the salinity at exactly right. 1.009. And I also recommend using an auto top off because if the salinity just inches up to 1.010, we'll just say, you know, the treatment could be, could be null and void. The other, my primary problem with, with hypo is while it does treat ick and flukes, there are a number of other diseases that it actually suppresses, but doesn't completely eliminate. Uh, velvet is probably a great example. Uh, Brook is another one, uranema. So while you've got these fish in hypo, let's just say for 30 days, and you've maybe treated ick and flukes as you're bringing the salinity back up, you're like, what are these white dots all over my fish? Uh-oh, I've got velvet. Mm -hmm. So now I've got to treat with copper or some other treatment to, to eliminate um, uh, velvet. And velvet is my, my number one concern because in the, I mean, uranema is a problem, no doubt, but Velvet seems to be, I mean, on the form, it's the number one killer. It's the number one tank killer. It's the number one encountered pathogen right now. It seems to be, you know, in, in every retail and wholesale, and it's in the, in the supply chain. So that is always my caution with hypo is that it suppresses but doesn't eliminate velvet. And then as you're bringing the salinity back up, you know, the fish is, is covered in velvet. Absolutely. Dan, what about seahorses? Hypo salinity. I agree with what he just said entirely. Um, the right. big thing that we deal with is uranema, and um, uranema can handle hyposalinity in most cases. Um, so I don't, I'm not a big fan of using that as a treatment. I'd rather do a dip or formalin treatment, or if necessary, you know, go to, to whatever other agent that I need to go with. Okay, and um, then Bobby, before we get to cross contamination, I'm curious how you feel about captive breeding. And I know there's a lot of fish in the reef world that we can't captive breed. In the seahorse world, it's all captive bred. You, you gotta do captive bred. So I'm just curious if you think that captive breeding of other fish will end up leading to less of these problems. Um, probably eventually. I mean, as, as more and more species are captive bred and there's less um, um, wild caught fish brought into wholesale facilities, um, I, would, I would hope um, that it would lead to less diseases. But, you know, it's kind of weird. Like my counterpoint to that is go to Petco or uh. PetSmart sometime and go, go into the freshwater section. Yeah. And, and all those fish are really captive bred and still they're covered in ick and velvet and, and different pathogens. So, yeah. I mean... Look I at guess. the tanks and yeah. look at the way the way they're being treated in those tanks, those facilities. Yep. I mean, well, it's well, the other problem is, is that anytime you read anything when, about aquaculture, you'll find that anytime you have high densities with high organics, you have an opportunity for things to break out and happen. Yep. Um, you know, it's you won't maybe not have as many different things, but whatever takes hold can really go rampant and. You know, just because they're captive bred does, you know, a lot of people think they're, you know, disease free just because they're captive bred. No, that's not true. You have to go with somebody, you have to go with a captive breeder who has a reputation and is conscientious in what they do. True. Well, you also have to look at the, the kind of facility they have. Are, are they running a closer system, which is crash, cross contaminating everything if, if one tank has a problem? And yeah. cross contamination, go ahead, Marina. I was just going to say there's also a really big difference between um, managing it something and keeping it at a level that it's safe and eradicating it altogether mm. and it not being there. A fish can't catch something that doesn't exist in that environment. Um, but if it's there, you're sort of waiting for something to happen and stress the fish and bring it up. Absolutely. Right. And Dan, uh, why do, like, is it the skills or lack of skills? Why do seahorses not, uh, why do we not see ick and stuff so often in seahorses? 
Is it the cap I don't and free or what? Uh, well, I think part of it is is their structure. I mean, you know, they're 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 and they have scales, but they're fused scales. And I think it's kind of like an armor for the outside where with regular fish, I think it's easier for those types of uh, things to take hold on them. You know, seahorses, if we're going to see those, it's only going to be in the oral cavity or the, uh, the gills. Lucky us. Okay, um, totally jumping around, but Ichthyo Geek, I hope I pronounced that correctly, said, jumping back to seahorses plus lower salinity. Could this be a viable option for increasing oxygen, reducing bacterial infections, like keeping them at a constant lower salinity? No. No. Okay. No. Another, no. Go ahead. no the, re the reason I don't like to go to hyposalinity when I'm treating with treating bacterial infections is most of the time we're using bath therapy. And you, if you lower the salinity, that means they're going to drink less water, which means they're going to ingest less medicine. So if nothing else, you want to increase the salinity so they ingest more water to maintain their osmotic balance and ingest more medication. Gotcha. Okay, and Ray, uh, I'm reading your ticked off about something. I'll read that later, right? Um, Dylan's little hobby asked, might be a little off topic, but besides mysis, what can you feed to treat to, see, to horses, especially live treats to gut load meds like that? I think he's asking... Uh, what do you suggest for gut loading uh, to make seahorses healthier? And then we're jumping back to Bobby. Go ahead, Dan. Um, well, your, your selections are relatively limited. Um, the most efficient way to do it is to use Artemia, uh, which is quick, cheap, and easy to do. You could do something like mices, uh, live mices, but to do that, typically we gut load the Artemia, then feed the Artemia to the mycids, and then the mycids to the seahorses. So I just skip that step and go straight uh, Artemia to the seahorses. Ghost shrimp would be the same thing. You'd have to gut load them by gut loading something else for them to eat it. Mm -hmm. So um, in terms of gut loading, you know, Artemia is the most efficient way of doing it. Gotcha. All right, let's, uh, let's dive into cross-contamination, and I want to hop to Bobby. Um, when you're talking about quarantine tanks and such, does there need to be space between that and the display tank, and why? So they, there was a study done, and, and some people take issue with this, but there was actually a study done where they proved that um, parasites, aerosolized um, droplets, could transport parasites up to 10 feet. Now, the caveat is that they actually did it in outdoor. They used high-powered fans with, with ponds. So it was done under extreme conditions to basically demonstrate that under, I guess, we'll say optimal conditions that aerosolized parasites could travel up to 10 feet. Now, obviously, in a, in a home environment, that's not really possible. But, you know, we do have, we do run ceiling fans. We do have air ducts, um, air conditioning runs. I tell most people I... I have, I personally observe the 10 foot rule because I just, you know, better safe than sorry. Um, I personally like to keep my quarantine tank in a completely different room than my DT because, you know, then it's just, you know, if it's in the same room, how easy it just is it to put your hand in the quarantine tank and then you don't think about it. And next thing you know, your hands in the, in, in the display tank, yes. if it's in different rooms, it kind of gives you some pause as you're walking to think, okay, I don't really need to do that. Um, I would say at a, at a bare minimum, I would, I would keep them six feet away. I like 10 feet, but you know, I'm, I'm, I don't take any chances when it comes to, to biosecurity and cross-contamination. And do you keep um, separate, like for instance, I'm just trying to like get you to talk a little bit more about say like the nets and do you have separate yeah. equipment for each tank? Would you, because a lot of people talk, you talked earlier in fact about if you know that your display tank is clean, you can use the water uh, from a water change for that tank, but if you don't know, and from then on forward, do we need to be really careful about equipment? And go ahead. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, you, de you definitely want to have, you know, for your quarantine tanks, you want to have dedicated nets, buckets, hoses. I mean, everything. I mean, you don't want to ever share, even even feeding. I wouldn't even. I would go so far to say, if you know, you're going to, uh, you know, when you go to feed your quarantine tank, you want to use a different feeding apparatus and a different. Uh, you know, and everything because you you don't want to ever risk cross contamination. When I had my uh, my business set up, I mean, I was doing it, I was running out out of my house. 
I had a room that was my quarantine room. And I mean, you can ask my wife, the ladders didn't even leave the room. The ladders that I used in my quarantine room had to stay in the quarantine room. And then I was so paranoid about it. I actually, you know, I would have a schedule set up where in the morning I'm fooling with the quarantine room and feeding them or doing whatever I had to do. And I would go take a shower before I fooled with what I call my retail room, which was where the finished product with the fish I was selling would go. Um, so yeah, it's one of those things you want to be paranoid about it. You don't want to share any equipment, nets, feeding apparatus. Um, and you even want to be very careful. I would say wash your hands very thoroughly and let them dry off for a while before you're going from QT to, to DT. Yeah, I think Dan always says wash your hands with Dawn soap, I think, maybe. Just dishwashing soap. I'll mine with hydrogen peroxide. Depending <laughs> on We're back to peroxide. <laughs> <laughs> and and Ray, Ray made a comment um, because he's not with us tonight. I want to make sure to shout out to him that parasite air transferred just like rotifers. If he had rotifers in the same room as brine shrimp, the brine tank would get infested with rotifers and crowded out the brine. So it's real. It's I don't doubt it. Yeah. Aerosolized, trans, aerosol transmission. You know, at the hobbyist level, it's not a big deal. But in the level that I was dealing with, I had very tight space and lots and lots of tanks. I had about uh, anywhere from 2,500 to 3,500 gallons of seahorses at any one time. And cross-contamination was an issue, even though we did all these things of separate buckets, separate siphonings, you know, separate nets, separate uh, everything. But just the proximity itself was problematic. So... After doing some study and some reading on the peroxide, what they do in the hospitals, where they aerosol rooms with peroxide instead of sending the, the cleaning crew in there to clean it, they found out that that was more effective. So I set up a system where I was using a humidifier and I was adding peroxide to the humidifier and mm -hmm. my uh, production rates went up as a consequence. Mm -hmm. Nice. But, uh, wherever the peroxide lands, it sterilizes. So. People don't realize that you touch the tank and then you touch something else and then go wash your hands and come back and then touch that thing. Well, you now you're cross contaminating. Yeah, exactly. I told you guys that uh, Dan was the peroxide man. <laughs> I told you in air conditioning oh. and stuff. Anyways, um, one more thing that I want to make sure we do jump into and then we can open chat and then end it because we've been going again for two hours. I just love talking to you people. It's so awesome. Um, and thank you in the comments for saying great discussion. If I missed your comment, comment it again or your question, comment it again because I have a hard time navigating Facebook and YouTube at the same time. So please comment again if you want me to ask a question. You can always ask a question after we're, we're done being live because I always check them later and could, could ask any of these people um, if I don't have your answer. But, wow, now I forgot what I was saying. I remembered garlic. I'm curious, Bobby. Um, how the reefing world feels about garlic these days. And yeah, that's, I'm gonna leave it there. So most, most of us agree that garlic is useful as um, an appetite stimulant. And, you know, obviously going back to using nutrition to mitigate diseases, if the fish is eating and eating often and eating a, a lot, then that helps boost their immune system. Um, there are, are some that, that believe that um, garlic is useful for uh, either treating or mitigating diseases. I, I think there's, you know, it's weird. I've kind of looked into it. I think there's maybe some scientific evidence for bacterial infections and other things. So my pet, and I, this is just my little pet theory on garlic. If garlic, if ingesting garlic does possibly work to, uh, to expel parasites, we'll just say, then my pet theory is if you've ever been around someone that um, that eats a lot of garlic, you can actually smell it on them because yep. it, it you know it leaches back out through their pores. I wonder if a fish in, in, ingests garlic, is it possible that the garlic um, basically leaches back out through the through the scales and makes them the taste of it then makes them an undesirable host for the parasite. So the trophon will drop off sooner because it just doesn't like the taste of garlic. Um, I love that theory. Go ahead. Sorry. No, it's just my pet theory. I've got nothing to back it up. There's no scientific evidence. It's just one thing I've always thought of that it, maybe that's how possibly garlic works to combat parasites. If it does. If it does. If it does. My wife is reminding me. I'm not <laughs> saying it does. I'm just saying it's... In other words, garlic... I, I like that theory so much that I shared it with Dan before the stream. I can't wait to hear his response, but go ahead, Cheryl. 
I was going to say, garlic makes the fish stink. <laughs> well, the there problem with garlic is that, you know, when you look at the most active compound in garlic, the organic sul sulfur compounds, it has many of them, but the most potent one that does all the magic is allicin. Yeah. And allicin is created when, when garlic is crushed and the, alan and the alanase come together, it creates allicin. The problem is, is that within seconds uh, afterwards, it's, it gets weak and it goes away. Some of the other organic sulfur compounds stay active, but that one virtually goes away. And in the seahorse world, we use a, um, a product called um, Alimax, which is, we use it as a topical, not as an oral, but as a topical treatment for uh, bacterial infections, it's extremely effective. There's a guy in England, Peter, Dr. Peter Josling, who found a way to make Allison uh, stabilized. And when you buy garlic products in the store and use them, and one of the reasons why I think we see such a wide variety of results is that a lot of these products don't have much of the Allison in it. So, you know, it's, it's not a stable compound. So as a consequence, you know, if you buy garlic that's been sitting on the shelf for a long time or have opened it and used it, then it's not been refrigerated and whatnot. There's very little Allison in there to do the magic. Um, the, when you use when you use a product that is primarily Allison, I've seen it, you know, diabetics that have had cuts that take two or three months to heal, heal in a week using Allison directly on it. Um, you know, I, I once had a real, I had an infection on my hand. It went, had streaks going up my arm that I treated with Allison overnight before a trip. And I was doing it every hour for five hours because I didn't have time to go to the doctor, get on antibiotics. I wasn't going to make the trip. So the next morning when it was, uh, after doing that, there was no streaks and there was no swelling. There was no tenderness and it looked normal. So, uh, hey, I want to say idea. really quickly, Noah, I see your uh, questions. I will ask them before we stop the stream. But Bobby, I was curious, um, is it used, in, is Allison or Alimax uh, used in that way with fish or have you heard of that or? I actually, I know absolutely nothing about that. Um, that's the first time I've heard of that. Well, I'll tell yeah. you, I had a seahorse that stuck his head through a hole in a rock mm -hmm. and he fought to get out and it skinned up his snout really bad. He was quite swollen. Oh. Well, I pulled him out, put some Alimax on his snout, and I'm thinking, okay, I got to get a hospital tank ready. Within four hours, his snout was looked almost normal. Wow. So yeah, yeah. I mean, this this is all about sharing information that helps each so, other. Who was talking? That's a really good question. So sure. when I, it's been twenty over twenty years since I've actually kept a seahorse tank, and I know when they would get these infections, I, and I remember it now. I would use the topical treatment called bio bandage, which was yes. no medicine. They don't based. make it anymore. Ah, they don't make it anymore. Well, okay. they can it's still also, get it in Europe, it, but go ahead. It's it's also not very effective, and the problem is, is that if whether you're using bio bandage, whether you're using neomycin or some other type of triple antibiotic. Most antibiotic type treatments like that are you're covering the skin and it's only treating the surface. The, okay. the wonderful thing about Allison and garlic uh, in general is that garlic permeates uh, down into the, the skin and it's able to permeate across the cellular membrane. So, you know, when I when I'm treating cuts, I get another example is MRSA. You know, my grandson had a real bad case of MRSA from the hospital uh, for, as a form of a rash on his behind. And after two weeks of antibiotics, I finally showed up and gave my daughter some uh, Allison and said, try it. And at that point, she was willing to not listen to the doctor, go ahead and do it. And within two days, it was gone. Yeah. You know, wow. it's able to permeate in and do its magic. And it's very, very effective at bacteria. It's very effective at fungal infections and it's very effective with uh, parasites. But you know, the problem with oral ingestion, which is a different ballgame entirely because different animals react to the garlic inside their body than humans do. Humans can tolerate oral ingestion, but for example, dogs, you don't want to give them high doses of garlic, you'll kill them. And I think there have been some studies about fish in their liver or something, maybe? Yeah, it's it, it it affects. I don't remember the exact how right. it affects, but I believe it affects the red blood, red blood cells and... Um, I have to go back and reread it because I sure. don't remember the details. Sure. So this is best used as a topical treatment. So I'm thinking it could be used on, well, saltwater fish for like fibro infections. 
Yes, which, you know, gram negative bacterial infections. Because yes. currently the best treatment that we have is Cipro, is doing a, a, a high, like a 250 milligram per gallon, two hour Cipro bath and use a little methylene blue. That's probably the most effective we have for, for you know, tropical fish for, for treating gram negative bacterial infections. Yeah, in the seahorse world, we normally use um, uh, furon, which is a nitrofuron. Okay. Um, that we found to be the most effective. Now, I won't say most effective, the best long-term effective uh, product. You know, okay. we were using some other things that um, neomycin, canamycin. The problem with neomycin is it's very hard on the renal system. And we would treat seahorses at the doses recommended by Noga, and we would combine it with triple sulfa, which gives it a synergistic effect. The problem was we'd lose a seahorse six months later to renal failure. So, um, you know, by going to the, the, they tolerate nitrofurons very well. The nitrofurons work pretty well with uh, Vibrio type infections. Well, plus we can gut, gut load uh, brine shrimp with that. Yeah. And get uh, it chemically as well. But as far as the topical treatment, the way that I, I have my seahorse customers do it is that the Allison comes in two forms. It comes as a liquid and it comes as a gel. And it really doesn't matter to me which they get. The key is, is to lift the animal out of the tank, pat the area dry with a paper towel, put a couple of drops on there or smear a little bit of the gel on there, let it sit for 30 seconds to a minute and then put the animal back in the water. And that gives it a chance to seep in a little bit before it you know, gets a chance to get washed off in the water. Okay, so uh, one thing I wanna say real quick is everyone make sure you remember that I introduced all these fine, fantastic people on Wine Wednesday. All right, I get credit. Just kidding, guys. Just kidding. But okay, I do. I know you guys want to chat more. I'm going to open chat it for until for the next 10 minutes. But I wanted to ask Noah's um, two questions. And they are number one, when can he expect his five inch erectus pair to breed? They've been in the tank for a month. The male used to show spawning behavior, but not lately. And I'm going to say number two, but I can repeat it. Um, the other was, will feeding an NPS Gorgonian in a seahorse tank cause bacterial problems, which was kind of what I was uh, jumping to. Um, the floor is yours. Anyone? Well, the mating thing is when they, um, you know, get in the mood. So. Um. <laughs> but is it interesting that a five inch seahorse <laughs> was in the mood and now is not? Does that, does that maybe indicate that the tank? Need some adjustments or not? It could be, and it could be the female just isn't compatible with that particular male. I mean, just because She's you put a guy no. and a girl together doesn't mean something's going to happen. With seahorses? Um, Come on now, erectus? No. Normally, when you put a male and a female together, something does happen, but sometimes there can be various different things. It could be that one just isn't feeling well. It could be the tank environment. It could be any number of things that causes it. Um, you know, it it's hard to say why, but, you know, as a breeder, you know, we put together multiple pairs with the hopes that we get one pair to breed steadily, you know, because, you know, I, I'll have one out of five pairs give me the production I want. And I'll I had a female Go ahead, Cone, and the thing with her is she only liked little males. Once she got a little male, she started producing beautifully, but she wouldn't have anything to do with the larger adult males. <laughs> figure. Size matters. Don't ask me. Dan, size does not matter. That is not a lot of my show. <laughs> hey, it I, I was going to say maybe the male seahorse said to the female seahorse, you gained an ounce or two. And that hey, stop there. it. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. I'm just going to say my piece two cents would be join seahorses group, seahorse sources group on Facebook. Post your picture, ask your comments. You're going to get all this and more or um, jump in next week and we can discuss that further because I've never had a pair of seahorses not get right to trying to breed. They yeah. don't always succeed. I think we need to do a special on does size matter in seahorses. <laughs> you guys are killing me. Okay, what about the second question, you guys? Um, does feeding an NPS Gorgonian in a seahorse tank or any tank, frankly, um, lead to bacterial issues? I don't think so if the system can handle that amount of food and you're careful about, you know, removing detritus and excess waste. Um, 
I've got a bit of NPS in my seahorse tank and that tank gets fed a ridiculous amount right. of food. No, I agree with you. And, and when I always warn people away from NPS at first, it's just because it's another mouth to feed. So if you're uh, putting NPS in a seahorse tank where they're just getting the, oh, I'm going to say it wrong, but the massification, whatever, the stuff the seahorses spit out or whatnot, um, that's, you know, a good thing. Then they're eating it up and they're a part of the ecosystem. But um, if you are trying to care for NPS, like specifically in a seahorse tank, when you're new to seahorses and trying to care for them, that's just kind of what I say, eh, go one at a time learn them, figure them out. But go ahead and disagree with me, guys. Or not. Okay, <laughs> cool. All right, uh, Dylan's <laughs> asked, what can you feed seahorses besides mice? I think we already said that, but anybody? Well, you can, you, <clears throat> any kind of different types of shrimp. Um, you can give them peppermint shrimp and all kinds of different saltwater shrimp, live shrimp for them to eat. You can also feed some people have gotten them to eating small bits <clears throat> of squid and stuff like that, but that's the exception rather than the rule. But uh, uh, Dan, do you uh, typically recommend, I mean, you're the one that constantly says, you know, you can, you can easily keep seahorses just on frozen mices, right? Yeah, um, I had a customer that just contacted me uh, last week that uh, was looking to get more seahorses because the ones I sold them um, roughly a little over 10 years ago, they just lost them. Wow. Um, so that customer had had them for 10 years and was feeding my frozen mices solely. Nice. Well, I, I have a question. Do they eat amphipods and copepods? They do, and actually, amphipods would be a better choice than um, uh, mice. That's if you look at the studies of what they're finding in the gut, amphipods are the number one thing mm -hmm. in the gut. Copepods, on the other hand, are too small. Mm -hmm. And if you think about it, if they can eat a half to, if a seahorse can eat a half a cube of mice, how many copepods would it take to make a half a cube? Right. You know? Yeah, but that doesn't make feeding copepods bad. It just means that can't be no, the main but, diet. Right. It can't be their main diet, okay. but you also have people who will load up a tank with copepods. And because there's so many, it's like a kid in a candy store. They're feeding on the copepods and not eating the, the mice. Oh. And as a consequence, they actually starve themselves by eating copepods. I, I guess I was wondering how common is it to keep a mandarin with um, a, in a seahorse tank? I, would ju I was just thinking to myself, well, being it's a high organic load, that would fuel uh, copepods and well amphipods, and then that would you know be a, a a steady supply of food for the mandarin for the dragon. That Miss Marina, gonna, oh sorry, go ahead, Dan, and then Marina does. So I want to hear from her. Go ahead, Dan. I think you'll typically find that the most successful people with mandarins with seahorses typically like with reef tanks have larger tanks. Okay, you know, Marina, uh, do you? Have, you oh, sorry. Go ahead. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Marina, did you want to? say anything as the uh, Mandarin and seahorse keeper? Or am I wrong? Oh my God, am I calling you out your mom wrong? My no, biggest okay. problem with the amphipods. Got... Hang on, Cheryl, go ahead, Marina. I've got a pair of little baby captive bred um, Mandarin dragonets in, with my, in my seahorse tank. And they have doubled in size in the few months that I've had them because there's so many pods in the seahorse tank. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I would agree that it's there's so much food in there that the pods are, um, just have so much food that they can keep breeding and keep a really steady population. And um, I also somewhat consider the pods part of the cleanup crew. Nice. And, and, and I would say too, I think we can all agree that What's really important is, at least in Seahorse Tank, is making sure that you're set up properly with the proper equipment to deal with all of that, but the ecosystem can be grand in what you're just talking about. Go ahead, Cheryl. Well, I was just going to say, my biggest problem with amphipods, because I do feed a lot of live amphipods, is fishing the darn things out of my filter socks. <laughs> because they like to go over the overflow. They, they like to be in the dark. And yes. darn if they won't go over the overflow and hang out in the filter socks. 
And then amphipods prey upon copepods, right. and that makes it difficult because then the you know the mandarins, I think they typically like Tisby copepods. So yeah, it's, it's kind of a. I guess I'm thinking about setting up a seahorse tank in the near future, and I really like mandarins. So I'm like, well, this could you know I could do both. I could do seahorses, and I could maybe do a mandarin in the tank as well. If anybody can do friend. it, it's you. Go ahead, Cheryl. Yeah, I've got a friend. She's got at least three or four different species of dragonettes in her seahorse tank. Oh wow! Yeah, and well, she's yeah. it's a decent sized tank, and but she's got them eating uh, frozen foods now also. I can't even if, believe that. If you're doing a fifty gallon tank or larger, I don't think you'll have a problem. So it's the size. So size matters. I give up. I guess size <laughs> matters. Hey, really quick, because I want to uh, say something to you, Bobby and Jessica before we leave. Um, Holly, did did you have any questions? I know you've just been I so. I actually do. Please. Just speaking of the mandarins, because I have a mixed tank. So I have five seahorses, a mandarin dragonette, a blue spotted goby, and a peppermint shrimp. And if I want to treat for ciliates, since I have so many different things in there, would you recommend like freshwater dips for everything? Like, but the shrimp, like what's the differences in treating those different fish or is it easier or should I do both in treating the whole tank with peroxide? Like, yeah, what's could, we do, could we do Jessica's peroxide treatment instead? Go ahead. Forever. That's what I would do. I mean, because mandarins, dragonettes are are very, they're, what's the word? I'm, and they're not, they're, 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 they're very um, resistant to parasites. That's not oh. the word I'm looking for. They're, they're highly resistant to parasites. Um, if they do have them, it's going to be just a few trophons in the gills. Um, I mean, they're, they're just, they're, they're one of the most resistant, disease resistant fish there are. So I would think if you suspected you had ciliates in the tank and you wanted to treat, I would think Jessica's in-tank uh, peroxide dosing would be the best strategy. So do you think like for like the peppermint shrimp, would my dose be the one milliliter for eight to 10 gallons or less gallons than that? What do you think I should? I, I would start with the uh, one milliliter per 10. And I think I actually had meant to ask Jessica earlier. I don't know if she jumped off, but- She's here. Um, oh, she's mm -hmm. here. Okay, so well, let, let her answer this because she's better, uh, more qualified to answer this than I am. You add the peroxide, like how many hours in between? So when I was dosing, I was doing um, every eight hours. Um, okay. And then- also the overnight dosing, which was every 15 minutes for six hours. Um, but you really don't need to do that unless you're treating an active infection of something. Um, I've gone as high as one mil per three gallons without having any problems with shrimp. So I think the nice. main thing with them is just don't let it hit them directly. So, so do you so think, so do you, go ahead, Holly. Put it in a way and let it flow through the system, like maybe put right. it through the sump. Or something yeah, like that's what I did. I dosed it into the sump right in front of the return pump and just let it mix in that way. If you're dosing into the display, I dose near a power head so that it mixes in. Yeah, gotcha. Dan, did you have anything to add to that? Um, her, her dosing is very close to what I recommended to people. Um, one ml per 10 gallons is uh, a little less than one part per million and i used to what i would do is have the customer tell me how many gallons they had now we convert it to teaspoons for them so they would you know whether it was a quarter half full teaspoon or, or whatever um the other thing is that the idea of doing it every eight hours is a very good idea because the peroxide is not going to last very long especially at that low of a dose um and I do like using peroxide um, as a way of cleaning up the tank, but I also would recommend going with probiotics in addition to that. Yeah, so I, I made sure to use, um, I like Dr. Tim's Eco Balance. Um, I use that in conjunction with the dosing just to, to help boost the, because I do, I do think it affects the microbiome of the system yep. um, at some point. I did try as high as, every hour and a half 
dosing. Uh, and I ran into algae problems <laughs> at that point. Really? Um, I, I think it, I did. I, I actually ended up, I thought I had Dinos at one point and fortunately they weren't Dinos. Uh, it was Euglena algae, um, but it just took over. So, and then I ended up with a nasty hair algae problem and had to get a fox face to get rid of that and all that. So um, it dosing too frequently gave me algae issues. So I wouldn't go too high with it. That's so if, interesting. If you're going to dose frequently, I would recommend having a uh, pump, a dosing pump, and do a lower dose oh, sure. over a long period of time. A gradual, gradual that frequent. Holly, yeah. did yeah. you? Yeah, yeah, I did. Go ahead, Jessica. Um, so I didn't have that. I didn't have the algae problems dosing with the overnight dosing because that was a very small dose. Um, even though it was every 15 minutes when I did the every hour and a half dosing, I was doing my full, uh, into a, in, in about 140 gallon tank. It was a, you know, a full like 24 mils at a time, every hour and a half. That was too much. So don't, don't go that high. Well, yeah, and guys, you can, sorry, Dan, go ahead. I would expect that after a few doses, you're going to start catching up with the organics and it's going to start lasting longer. Mm. Yeah. Well, I just wanted to mention, guys, again, um, I think Jessica posted the links earlier, but I will make sure to in the comments and in the actual description of this video, um, make sure you have links to Humblefish because they cover all of this in the forum. Um, so definitely check it out. And Holly, before I uh, say something sweet and nice to Bobby and Jessica, um, Holly, Marina, did you have any other questions before I cut it off? And by the way, Bobby and um, Jessica, you can hang out if you want afterwards. Um, we, we talk for a little bit afterwards, but you don't have to. But Holly Marina, any questions? I'm good. Thank you. That, that was great. Me too. I've really enjoyed listening. Okay, well, I'll just say that I had about 50 other questions written out for Humblefish <laughs> that I didn't get to ask. So we're going to require you guys to come back. And I just wanted to personally Can thank... Bobby and Jessica for coming, uh, Jessica especially for making an appearance, but both of you, um, and if you, and Bobby, if you do um, end up setting up a seahorse tank, we would love for you to come and share and give updates, and you guys have the link, you can join anytime, we'd love to have you. We thank you very much for coming. Thank you. All right, everybody, sorry to cut it off, but it's at that two hour time. Everybody say cheers, raise your glasses. Cheers. 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 Happy Wine Wednesday, everybody. Cheers. Good night.